What's up, YouTube? Silver Dragons here, and today I'll be talking with Keith Newmeyer, the founder and CEO of First Majestic Silver, also founder and chairman of First Mining Gold. We talk about the current bull run in precious metals. Keith, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks. Uh, first time interview, and uh, it's a fantastic environment out there to have a discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very excited for this one. Um, really, really interested to get your thoughts on pretty much everything gold and silver, what they've been doing in 2020. It's been a crazy year. I wanted to first jump into silver. So one month ago, we're looking at $18 an ounce, and today it's right around 28 Do you think this is just the start, and how much potential do you think silver has? Well, quite honestly, I've been waiting for a correction, but, um, you know, I remember, you know, back in 2011 or 2010, 2011, silver had you know even more of a dramatic move so you know silver can do these types of things and it's playing catch up very much with gold uh you know we had gold at twelve hundred dollars uh a year ago and and now it's you know broken through two thousand now you know touching twenty one hundred or at least close to twenty one hundred and silver is really lagged and it's only in the last three to four weeks that silver is really caught up and and last time gold hit its highs previous highs of nineteen hundred dollars an ounce Silver had hit $50 an ounce. So at $2,100 gold, you know, silver should be a lot higher than where it is today, despite the fact it's run up so quickly. Do you think that, uh, so I know you founded First Majestic Silver in 2002, um, so you've been in the game quite a while, but do you feel like this current run up is different to 2011? Well, I've been in the mining sector for 35 years, so uh, I did put First Majestic together back, as you said, 2002, 2003, and I predicted $50 silver at the time and did hit $50 uh, in 2011. I didn't expect silver was going to fall all the way from 50, you know, down to 13, but, um, you know, it was, um, you know, a lot of money started going into the U.S. market, you know, at that time, and, you know, we had this high-tech uh uh, boom, uh, you know, Apple and Amazon, you know, you, well, you know, all the names. And so there was a flood of money into, you know, U.S. stocks. And these miners or, or a lot of the sectors, the emerging markets were left behind in the dust. And then it's only recently in the last year or so where people are starting to wake up to the fact that, hey, you know, governments are printing money. This is not going to change anytime soon. Um, you know, the, the currencies as we know it are being debased by all governments around the world and what is the granddaddy of all currencies it's gold and and uh, you know I think you have to have gold in your portfolio it's just part of you know my investment thesis um, uh, silver it tends to be the much more volatile you know uh, animal you know or, or you know volatile commodity so you know if you you know if you can weather the volatility as some people you know all, often have challenges doing um, you know it's it's gold times you know three or gold times five from a volatility standpoint but um, I love silver you know silver is a very un understood commodity you know I call it a strategic metal um, you know everything that we do in, in the human race including this call requires silver you know people couldn't move around uh, uh, in their automobiles they couldn't you know their houses wouldn't work all the gadgets that we're used to using on a daily basis which is just simply not work you know silver is a critical component in every person's life on a daily basis and it's very very misunderstood silver is not gold you know silver is a strategic commodity that is is required to do all the things we do as a human race to make this planet green electrify the planet in different ways and uh, we're in a, a very severe supply constraint environment and that's starting to show up in prices right now you mentioned supply constraint i definitely want to talk about that but one thing you mentioned before that was silver's volatility i think we really can see that in the gold to silver ratio i mean we had all-time highs not too long ago what it was a hundred one to 120 i think um, and now it's all the way down to one to 73 or somewhere in that range. Uh, so do you think the gold silver ratio is going to continue to drop? And, and do you put any uh, belief in the GSR? Is that something that we should be looking at? I'm a huge believer in the gold silver ratio. Um, and you're right. It did you know, in March when the world was falling apart and, you know, the, the Dow was down, you know, or the S&P was down, you know, seven or eight or 10 percent a day. And silver was being crushed and you know everything globally was being crushed and you know silver did drop quite substantially 
um, and then the ratio exploded to all all time highs. Silver had never seen you know north of a hundred dollars or, or pardon me a hundred to one silver to gold ratio in, in in known history. So it was a very unusual event that occurred, and now it's correcting back to more normal levels. Um, but your listeners should understand that the actual mining ratio, which is what I look at. Um, has been dro- dropping as well. You know, in the 18 years since I put First Majestic together, the ratio has almost been cut in half. And I mean the mining ratio. So for every one ounce of gold that all mining companies are mining worldwide, only eight ounces of silver are being mined, uh, which, which is in itself pretty nuts. So you mentioned a ratio of 73 to 1. Well, that's the trading ratio. So that's what the market value puts on silver. But it should be, in my opinion, much closer to the actual mining ratio because that's your actual supply demand number. So I think that's where we're going ultimately. And if we take that to its final conclusion, so with a, a GSR of one to eight, you know, in gold over two thousand dollars an ounce, uh, you know, we could be looking at potentially silver over two hundred and fifty an ounce. You know, if that happened, I mean, you think triple digit silver and, and numbers that higher in the cards. Well, I've been saying triple digit silver for probably, I don't know, 10 years. <laughs> sure. And, you know, I, I've been obviously wrong. Um, I, you know, I, I, I was right on my $50 prediction, you know, when I put First Manchester together, but but I've been a little bit challenged since then. But I, deal, I still do think that um, I will ultimately be right. And uh, I'm still a bull on gold. I think gold's going to go north of 3,000. And, you know, if you look, if you listen to others out there, you know, uh, and there's you know many other experts out there that talk about much higher numbers for for gold, but uh, you know even at three thousand dollar gold and call it ten to one, you know as as an easy math, uh, um, you know you're at three hundred dollars uh, silver. You know I you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, you know those are the kinds of numbers that I think are very plausible. Yeah, yeah, insane to think about. Um, one thing you did bring up was you know when everything sort of crashed back in March. I know silver went down to like. Oh, this is paper silver, right? Not physical, but I think it went down to like $12, maybe even lower intraday. I think it maybe touched 11 for a second, but uh, either way, how was everything from the mining standpoint? Were you guys selling silver at that time, holding on to it? Because I know a lot of the bullion dealers were holding on to their inventory or they just jacked up premiums, right? Like Atmex is charging $25 a silver eagle. What did that look like for you guys? Yeah, well, I would suggest that your listeners go to our website, you know, www.firstmajestic.com and look at our recent news releases. We put out uh, the last two news releases. One was on our production for the quarter and one was just our financial statements. And uh, our Q2 numbers um, uh, didn't have revenue for over, uh, well, for approximately a million ounces of silver and a few thousand ounces of gold. When silver and gold dropped the way they did, particularly silver, in March, I suspended all sales, and uh, <clears throat> we didn't sell any silver below $17. And and uh, uh, it took about I think it was four to six weeks before the the market recovered, and uh, we carried over quite a lot of silver and gold into Q3. So that revenue is going to show up in Q3, which is obviously pretty pretty good for our shareholders. Um, it didn't particularly look great for. Q2 because it made the revenue numbers much lower in Q2 than would have normally happened. But I just couldn't, um, um, you know, think of selling uh, silver at those ridiculous prices. I wasn't going to, you know, be mercy to the banks and, you know, and and, and give our silver away to, to you know, some, some of these, you know, crooked players that I think they're out there manipulating these markets. So, so I held on. I think it was the right decision to do. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, we made a, you know, probably five or six million extra in revenue as a result of that decision. And, you know, now we're, you know, selling silver, you know, north of twenty five, twenty six dollars an ounce, which is even going to look better for our Q3 and Q4 numbers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I know coronavirus impacted like virtually every industry. Um, is it still affecting First Majestic Silver's mines or are you guys pretty much all back up and running at this point? The the three mines that we have um, um, are are running. Um, it they've had a bit of a slow start. You know, in Mexico, I'm not sure if your listeners understand what's gone on in Mexico, but um, the coronavirus has hit Mexico pretty hard. Um, the 
the government has deemed a group of individuals as um, vulnerable uh, individuals. So vulnerable individuals don't need to go to work. And these are individuals that are, you know, higher than 60 years old or, um, you know, with, with certain ailments like diabetes or obesity or, or heart conditions or things like that. The they health department came up with a list. So there's about 18% of our workforce that is actually deemed vulnerable. So the, that 18% can stay home. So, you know, it does impact the operations to some degree because, you know, some of these uh, individuals are some of our, you know, highest and most, you know, oldest and most skilled workers. And uh, so we've had to fill in some of those gaps, which has been a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, um, you know, production over the last, uh, uh, well, since the beginning of August has looked pretty good, but um, July did have a bit of a slow start. But, uh, you know, we expect that, you know, by the end of Q3 or to Q4, that everything will be back up and running. And, and we're working to try to make back the ounces we lost, you know, during during the closures, you know, because we did have, you know, six-week closure, as, you know, many people obviously know. Right, right. Let's kind of switch directions here. Obviously, there's been a lot of stimulus packages, right? And and the future of the economy uh, sort of is it's a bleak outlook at this point. Um, uh, do you think that's uh, good news for gold and silver? They're going to continue to climb, or what are your thoughts on that? I don't think they're related. Um, uh, you know, the COVID, I guess, was um, the pin that burst the bubble. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've been waiting. You know, the, this this market has been on a tear. And when I mean this market, I mean the U.S. stock market primarily. And this is very similar to, you know, I've been around for a long time in this market. And um, this is so reminiscent to 1999-2000 to me. Uh, only time will, of course, tell. Cause it's easier to look back than it is to look forward. But, um, uh, you know, when we had the Nasdaq bubble, you know, Y2K, many of your listeners probably don't even know what Y2K is. But, you um, you know, um, it's very reminiscent of that type of bubbly type of environment. And, and you know, when it when it rolled over, it rolled over hard. And there was a couple of, you know, pretty interesting corrections. And no one knew we were actually in a bear market. But, you know, when, when the NASDAQ peaked out at 5,000 in March of 2000, you know, over the next three years, it lost 80%. And it didn't hit its high until 2015. So it took... All, it took approximately, you know, go back and look at the chart yourself, but it was about 13 years uh, that it took from the NASDAQ's peak for it to reach its peak again, um, you know, I think in 2015. So that was a long bear market in the U.S. equity markets. And, of course, that turned around. It was that 15-year period, you know, starting really about 2002, 2003, that the mining sector really took off and we had a 10-year bull market where we saw silver prices go from five dollars an ounce all the way up to 50 and we saw gold go from 250 to 1900. now if you look at the lows in in let's call it uh uh january uh, well december 2015 you, know, you, you look at 13 dollars silver and um uh 1100 or 1050 gold and you look at the same types of moves, you know, an eight times move on gold and a 10 times move on, on silver, which happened from 2003 to 2012, you, you extrapolate that to today and you're, you're talking about, you know, $8,000 gold and, you know, pretty impressive silver prices. So uh, I think that's what we're getting into. I think we're going to see at least a five-year bull market, possibly a 10-year bull market like we had um, uh, previously. Um, but, you know, you know, where, you know, who knows for sure, but that's the type of uh, move I'm expecting to see. Right. Yeah. And that's interesting too, a five or 10 year bull market. Cause a lot of people, you know, they're looking at this and saying, okay, uh, you know, should I, should I be getting out of the silver and, and gold game? And, you know, on my channel, I'm like, no, 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 this is when you should be getting in. If you're not already, you're, you're too late, you know? So it seems like we agree on that for sure. Well, look, it's a, it didn't people say the same thing about Apple? You know, I, you know, I've looked at Apple. You know, I've never actually bought Apple shares because I was always thinking, oh my God, I missed it. And uh, you know, Amazon shares the same thing, and you know, Tesla shares are saying the same thing. Um, you know, because you know, it, it's hard to buy stocks when they're moving higher because you're always paranoid that you're 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 too late. But um, I don't know. It's just there, there's. With the money printing that is going on, with, with, with what's happening, and you bring up COVID, and I said it's got nothing to do with COVID. This is a financially driven 
phenomenon where we have a very major demographic move. You know, the boomers are retiring. Governments are printing money like crazy because they're trying to support the economy. They're trying to support the market thick and thin. They won't let this market correct. They won't let a natural economic um, uh, recession, depression occurs, which is necessary to be healthy for the you know long-term sustainability of any any country, any industry, or you know any economy. Uh, but they just won't let it happen. So they just keep printing money, printing money, and there's no end in sight. And as long as they keep interest rates close to zero and start, you know, just keep adding deficit after deficit after deficit, the only place to be is in the precious metals. And who knows when that's going to end? Is it going to be five or 10 years before the government say uncle and we've done it, we've made a mistake and we're going to go back to a sound money type of type of system? You know, I don't know. But, you know, that's where we have to go to all obviously right this ship. But in the meantime, there's no political will to do that. So in my view, at least for the next couple of years, you got to be in the precious metal sector. If that turns into a five year, 10 year bull market, only time will tell. Right. Yeah, it, it is interesting. The amount of inflation, right, because of all of this currency creation and whatnot. Um, and, and you also mentioned interest rates uh, being at zero. I, I believe in Europe, they're even in the negative and they've said they're going to be zero here in the U.S. till I think 2022 or something. And so I wouldn't be that surprised if we went negative and that just looks even more bullish for precious metals. Yeah. And and if that happens, you know, the U.S. dollar being the, you know, the major worldwide currency, you know, other than gold, uh, you know, that's very negative for the U.S. dollar. And that just puts more of more support in the granddaddy of currencies, which is gold. And, you know, what, you know, why are the Chinese and the Russians and, and many other countries around the world? You know, why are they been buying gold, you know, so much for the last three or four or five years? You know, they, you know, the, the gig is up, you know, the, 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 the be interesting to be, you know, in some of these private meeting rooms where these top government officials are talking about trying to resolve the current situation, because I'm sure there's quite a few interesting conversations going on. And I'm sure gold's part of that discussion. Yeah, undoubtedly. Um, so let's uh, switch gears here. Let's talk uh, first Majestic Silver. Um, so I know that there's some other large miners, obviously. Um, how does First Majestic compare to them right now? Well, First Majestic is all Mexico. You know, I put the company together back in 2002, 2003. I came from a copper company. I put a copper company together in 92, 93. And, you know, that copper company is, you know, one of the biggest copper companies on the planet. And uh, I, I, looked, I looked at silver and I just fell in love with silver in the early 2000s, just specifically for supply demand fundamentals. And, uh, you know, I looked, you know, I looked at silver and I go, holy cow, this is a, such a misunderstood metal. There's very few silver companies out there. Solar panels were in their infancy. Electric cars barely existed. And, and these two technologies now are consuming, you know, 20, north of 20 percent of, of the silver production uh, globally. And, you know, with all the electronics that we're using and cell phones and, you know, all the gadgets, you know, silver consumption has just, you know, been skyrocketing over the last, you know, 20 years. And and it's really causing a lot of um, issues in, in the supply demand fundamentals of the of the industry itself. And I predicted that. And, and uh, that despite the fact the last five years have been a little bit challenging, um, you know, I think we're now getting back into the beginning of another bull cycle, which, you know, who knows what's going to happen with the price. But we positioned ourselves, you know, very focused on silver. Um, 60 percent of our revenues in the form of silver, 40 percent of our revenues are in the form of gold. Uh, gold. Uh, we have three operating mines. We're the second or third largest silver producer in Mexico. We're the, we're the you know, one of the go to names um, in the silver space. We produce about 24 million silver equivalent ounces a year. New York listed, you know, 5000 employees spread throughout Mexico. Um, you know, I could go on, but, um, you know, that's it, sure. it in a nutshell. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, w I would say what's next, you know, for your company? I mean, I, the stock price doubled in 2019. Uh, so what's on the horizon for First Majestic Silver? Yeah, you know, when it comes to predicting share prices, it's, you know, I'm not really allowed to do that. I am the founder and CEO. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I, I still think the stock is cheap, but uh, I'm obviously biased. So I'm probably not the person you should be listening to. But, uh, <laughs> well, uh, um, uh, okay, but, but but if if we take that a different direction, 
um, you know, what's your company doing? Because obviously the price of silver is going up, but I assume you guys are still trying to become more efficient at mining and things like that. Yeah, of course, of course. So, so you know, back in you know 2014, uh, just uh, you know, if your listeners could kind of go back in time a little bit, you know, we had you know fifty dollars silver in 2011, and and uh, 2012, you know, most of that year we had kind of averaging about forty dollars. Uh, um, you know, 2013 we're about averaging about thirty dollars, and 2012 or 2014 um, the, the floor fell out of silver and it crashed through twenty dollars an ounce all the way down to $16 an ounce in, in June of 2014 and I panicked and I said what the hell's going on here and uh, our costs were probably north of 20 bucks an ounce and uh, you know we're spending lots of money so I, we, we spent from 2014 to really you know 2018 2019 a good four or five years of, of just turning over every single rock looking for ways to save money and, and uh, we use technology and uh, I'm very proud of uh, our innovative team. Uh, I put together a pretty solid IT uh, group of professionals that uh, really spent an enormous amount of time putting some pretty interesting processes and technologies into our operations. And we're pretty advanced. You know, if you compare us to many of the other, other miners out there, um, it, it's pretty impressive what we've been able to uh, achieve over that time. We cut our costs by 50%. And, and we're, you know, now today, you know, pretty profitable, and and uh, you know, we're getting ready for this next next big leg up uh, in, in silver prices, and we're very prepared for it. And you know, the, I guess from a a longer term perspective, you know, we're looking to, you know, how do we build the business? And um, you know, we're we're looking at, um, you know, bringing on some of our other mines within our portfolio because we do have some unperforming assets that we could turn on, but we're also looking at M and A as well, and. Uh, you know, we're with um, our our market or you know our market cap where it is and the improvements that we you know noticed or, or or achieved over the last 12 to 18 months, you know, puts First Majestic in a pretty strong position to make additional investments in the space to grow the business. Yeah, and especially if you know we are looking at a five or ten year bull run. Uh, this could be this could be quite good. So one thing that I wanted to get your opinion on a lot of people that. Uh, listen, my channel are the stackers, right? They buy the physical metals. And I talk a lot about diversity, usually diversifying from silver to gold because everyone's so heavy on, on silver, um, especially right now. Uh, but uh, uh, what about diversifying, you know, into uh, the miners and, and ETFs and other sort of paper silver products? I mean, I feel like if with this uh, run up, there could be a lot of potential for gains there. So uh, I, I'm assuming you share the same sentiment. Yeah, but look, there's ca- you have to have caution. Um, uh, you know, buying silver mining stocks or you know, gold or just period mining stocks, period. You know, don't forget, you're buying a stock. So, you know, companies fluctuate for whatever reason. Um, uh, you know, there could be a bunch of outside um, factors, you know, that affect stock prices, not just the mining stock prices, but all stock prices. Uh, and you just don't know. It's hard to predict. So, you know, your your risk of owning an equity is greater or a stock is greater than owning metal. And that's just the bottom line. Um, and, and I own a lot of silver. I own a fair amount of gold. And I love, you know, looking at my my metal and my my kids. You know, they 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 like to look at the metal as well. It's great to hold, and I love to have it. And and I wouldn't I wouldn't stop ever owning, you know, my physical metal. But from an equity or a stock perspective, you know, that's where you really get the beta. And uh, um, you know, if you go back, let, let, let's use 2016 as an example because it's you know what what happens in this current run. You said the stocks already doubled, which is true, but if you go back and look at 2016, I think it's a pretty good uh, measurement of what the potential could be um, just based on history. So, uh, in January of 2016, uh, our share price was four dollars a share. Um, silver was thirteen dollars an ounce. Uh, silver went from thirteen dollars an ounce to twenty almost 21 by July of, tw- of 2016. You know, people can go look at the charts themselves. Our stock went from four to 25, I think it was approximately. So our stock went up, um, uh, what, five times, and and, and silver went up, um, uh, so our, the stock went up 500 times and silver went up about $7. So that's, you know, what, what's that? That's like a three time, three you know, three times, or actually a five times move. 
you know, three to right. five times removed. So, you know, if you, you know, and that's what should happen with any good uh, it, um, mining stock. You know, if you get a good quality gold stock or good quality silver stock in your portfolio, it should outperform the metal on, on somewhere between, you know, three to five times the move of the metal on a percentage basis. Doesn't always happen, um, but, you know, you also should remember it works the other way. So, you know, if metal prices are dropping, you also lose your, your investment, you know, more rapidly than you would you lose it if you own the physical metal, right? Because so, it's not as volatile as the equity. So it depends on really your investment thesis, depends on, you know, how much your stomach can weather. And, and uh, some people aren't, aren't fit to, you know, be in the stock market and, and they should just be in physical metal. Other people have more risk tolerance and, you know, will want to dabble a little bit on the equity side. Um, and if that's the case, you know, go look at management teams, you know, go, don't, don't get sucked into some promotion, some, you know, uh, promoter that's, you know, selling you moose pasture somewhere in, you know, wherever, you know, may make sure that, you know, it's a solid management team that has a track record that, you know, is, has made, you know, major companies in the past, you know, has created wealth for investors in the past. And, you know, that reduces your risk substantially if you go and follow management teams that have been successful historically. Sure. Yeah. And, um, uh... One last thing I wanted to get your opinion on. Um, a lot of people have talked about converting silver if the ratio continues to narrow. Um, and I, I think we agree it's probably going to, to go that route. Um, what would be a good point in your opinion to do that? Or should they just keep holding on to their silver bullion? Yeah, look, I, 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 you know, I know uh, Mike you know, Maloney does that a lot. You know, I listen to Mike Maloney, and maybe some of your listeners listen to him as well. He's, you know, he's very fact-based, and he loves the sector, and uh, he, he does trade the ratio. Like he'll sell gold, buy silver, and sell silver and buy gold. Uh, I've personally never done that. I, uh, I just, you know, I, I look at silver. I look at my physical silver and my physical gold as long-term assets that are going to remain in my portfolio until the day I leave this planet and they'll be passed on to, you know, to my kids. And uh, I don't look at ever liquidating my physical metal at all. Um, stocks are another animal altogether. You know, I, uh, of course, I've got my core holdings in First Majestic Silver and First Mining Gold. You know, I founded both of those companies and, you know, those those are my my core assets in my portfolio, which you know, obviously I can't sell unless, you know, they, you know, they go to much, much higher prices or potentially I might retire, um, which isn't going to happen anytime soon. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, but nevertheless, you know, with the, the other investments, of course, being so knowledgeable about the mining sector, I play in the space a lot. Uh, but I trade the space because, you know, when you, you know, see, you know, you buy a stock at, you know, 30, 40, 50 cents and all of a sudden it's a buck, you know, you better sell half your position and and, and, sure. uh, and, and just, just that's what you do without even questioning it. It doesn't matter. Just sell half your position and then and, and the other half of your position is now free. So, right. you know, the other half of your position could go to zero and you still break even. Right. Um, people have to have that type of discipline. And, and uh, trade this market because it's very volatile and you can get your head handed to you if you're not smart. So be on top of your portfolio, pick good management teams and, and trade the market. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Keith. Uh, who can listeners contact in the company uh, to get their questions answered? Yeah, our main uh, fellow uh, uh, in Vancouver, uh, Canada is uh, uh, our, our VP of, uh, of corporate development, Todd, Todd Anthony. Um, you know, you can just go to the info at firstmuchasset.com email address on the website. I would suggest people go look at our PowerPoint presentation and there's a lot of really good information in there. There's also a ton of information about silver. You know, if you really want to learn a bit, a little bit about silver, I would suggest you go there and really see some of the exciting things I think that are happening in the silver space. And of course, lots of stuff on First Majestic. And uh, if you want to uh, learn more about First Mining Gold as well, uh, just firstmininggold.com. Their presentations on their website as well. And a, a fellow named Spiro is is there. You know, again, just info at firstmininggold.com. Um, feel free to. Uh, send emails to them and they'll obviously get back to you with any answers to any questions that anyone may have. Awesome. And everyone needs to make sure they follow Keith on Twitter as well. What's your Twitter, Keith? No, oh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, my my Twitter is uh, uh, just at Keith underscore Newmeyer. 
I, I send some interesting stuff out of things that I like. Um, you know, my portfolio holdings I often comment about, and uh, I tend to put them out on Twitter. Awesome. Well, Keith, once again, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I really appreciate getting all your thoughts and insight during this uh, crazy time. So uh, thanks again. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching my video. I sincerely appreciate it. If you enjoyed the interview with Keith Newmeyer, make sure to hit that thumbs up. Uh, also, subscribe if you're new to my channel so you don't miss any videos talking about gold and silver. And last but not least, feel free to leave a comment down below. Uh, what did you think of the conversation? And what are your thoughts on silver and gold moving forward? All right. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in my next one. Silver Dragons, out.